All right, intro to some probability. This is not a very difficult section. Let's get going. What is the probability of an event that is impossible? So if an event is impossible, the probability is going to be zero, okay? Any questions about that? So basically probability runs on a scale from zero to one. Zero being impossible, one being 100% likely, and somewhere in between, okay? Suppose that a probability is approximated to be zero based on empirical results. Empirical means an, an experiment. So an experiment shows that this particular outcome event is pretty much not likely to happen. Does this mean that the event is impossible? Not necessarily. Just because an experiment says that it wasn't gonna happen doesn't mean that it's never going to happen, impossible, make sense? There's always a chance that something will happen, but what we do is we conduct multiple experiments over and over and over again, empirical studies, to see what's the likelihood of it happening. Probably zero, doesn't mean it's completely impossible. No, not necessarily. Nothing is black and white in that when we're talking about probability. It's just higher likelihood, lower likelihood. In a probability model, the sum of the probabilities of of all outcomes must equal one. Yes, this is true. We'll talk more about it as we go through problems. Probability is a measure of the likelihood of a random phenomenon or chance behavior. This is true, but notice the likelihood of something happening, okay? In probability, a blank is any process that can be repeated in which the results are uncertain. This is known as an experiment. Pretty straightforward. I mean, look at these other options. Outcome, unusual event, sample space, no. An experiment is basically something that, a process that can be repeated to see if what happens, we don't know which results, okay? Next, is the following a probability model? What do we call the outcome yellow? Well, let's answer the first question. Is the following a probability model? For this to be a probability model, all of those probabilities, remember like I said, they must total what? One. one. They are gonna range between zero and one, and when you're doing the whole probability and determining if this is a model, you have to add these together to check off if it's one. If it doesn't, then you're not even moving forward. So 0.35 and 0.3 is 0.65, this is another 0.3, that's 0.95, still 0.95. That puts it over, doesn't it? That puts it as, at 1.05. So if you add all these together, this is a probability model of 1.05. That's not correct. All of those must total, must total exactly one. So no, it's not because the probabilities do not sum to one. They have to sum to one, not less than, not greater than, okay? What do we call the outcome yellow? So even though this is not necessarily a correct probability model, we still can just at least say something about yellow. What can we say about yellow? Yes, now, when we have a zero, then we can call it impossible. Make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. It's not going to happen, at least in this particular model. Why is the following not a probability model? What did I say probabilities have to be? Fall between what numbers? Zero. And can they be negative? Mm. No, they can't. So you cannot have negative probabilities. Green is a negative probability. Something is wrong. So we cannot have probabilities less than zero, and that immediately um, uh, eliminates this from being a probability model, okay? Which of the following numbers could be the probability of an event? Can zero be an event, the probability? Can zero? Yes, it can, right? That's impossible. Can 1.25? No. no, because 1.25, is greater than our range. It has to be falling from zero to one. So no, 0.04, yes. One, absolutely. 0.27, yes. Negative 0.42, absolutely not. So as long as the values fall 
between zero and one, they can be a probability. Now, if they fall below zero, above one, absolutely not. Okay, next. In a certain card game, the probability that a player is dealt a particular hand is 0.42. This is clearly a valid probability, as we've established. Explain what this probability means. If you play this card, well, let's first uh, answer that one. What does this probability mean? It means that approximate, so the thing that you want to do in this section is never allow any answers in that say exactly. Like we said, probability is an approximation. It's not black and white like I referenced earlier. So A and D are immediately out. And for future questions, you need to immediately eliminate them if they use black and white terms like exactly, um, precisely, things like that. So B and C are, are our options. So a probability of 0.42 means that approximately 42 out of 100 dealt hands will be that particular hand. Good. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now, the second half of it, if you play this card game 100 times, will you be dealt this hand exactly 42 times? What did we say about the word exactly? Yes. It's not to be used in our context. So, no, you will not be dealt this hand exactly 42 times since the probability refers to what is expected in the long term. That's correct. Okay? So, in the long term, that means that if you play it longer and longer and longer, you're going to get pretty darn close to 0.42. Make sense? Okay, it doesn't mean exactly, because exactly is like a short term type of concept. So, what are, what are the words that you want to eliminate and not use? Short term, exactly. Those are words that should not be part of your vocabulary when you're dealing with probability. Probability is just high likelihood, long term, okay? Suppose you toss a coin 100 times and get 89 heads and 11 tails. Based on these results, what is the probability that the next flip results in a head? Well, which is 89 divided by 100. Which is? 0.89. You got it, 0.89. So, this is easy because it's out of 100, so you can clearly see it's 0.89, but if you didn't, just simply take, what are they looking for? In my problem, they're looking for a probability of a head and divide it by the total number of times that you flipped your coin or whatever it happened to be. So that will give you your exact decimal, okay? Questions about that? All right, fantastic. Number 10, Bob is asked to construct a probability model for rolling a pair of pair dice. He lists the outcomes as those. Now, if you're not sure what they're referring to, let me help you with that. So we know that a dice is one, two, three, four, five, six sides, right? In general. And since we're rolling two of them, we're gonna set up a table this way. Everybody follow me? So here's dice number one and dice number two. You're rolling them twice which means that you could get a one on the first dice and a one on the second, follow me? You could get a two on the first dice and a one on the second. I'm not gonna go and fill out this entire table, but you can see at the very end of it, we could get a six and a six, everybody follow? So there are 36 possible ways that this can come up. Now, let's go answer the question. Bob reasoned that the probability of rolling a 10 must be one out of 11 options. Are there 11 options there? 36. There's 36. And rolling a 10 means that there's only one way to roll a 10. Well, is there only one way to roll a 10? No. There's a five and a five, four. a four, six, a six, four, and furthermore, there are other ways to roll different probabilities and different amounts of them. So the answer to this is no, his reasoning is not correct because uh, the experiment does not have equally likely outcomes. 
each number, two, rolling a two, rolling a three, rolling a four, five, six, whatever, there are different amounts of those that come up, okay? All right, number 11, next. So if a person spins a six space spinner and then flips a coin, Describe the sample space of possible outcomes using one, two, three, four, five, six for the spinner and heads and tails for the coin outcomes. What they mean by sample space is, is all the possible ways that that can happen. Kind of like I drew that table a moment ago of rolling the dice. All those options on that table are the sample space. So let's look at this. We could have a one and a heads, right? We could have a one and a tails, couldn't we? We could have a two and a heads and a two and a tails. Are you guys following me? Can we type out all of them? Type out all of them. Okay. A three with a head, a three with a tail, a four with a head, a four with a tail, five head, five tail, six head, and six tail. Can you think of any other way that this can happen? If you can, put it in there. Right now, I don't think so. We could spin the spinner and get a one and a head, a one and a tail, a two and a head, a two and a tail, all the way down to a six and a head, a six followed by a tail. So you would type all those in and pay attention. What did they say? Use a comma to separate your answers. Any questions about that at all? You guys all right? Correct? Yes, good, ready to move on? Great, let's go on, number 12. According to a certain country's Department of Education, 39.2% of three-year-olds are enrolled in daycare. What is the probability that a random, randomly selected three-year-old is enrolled in daycare? So, when you're talking about probabilities, you typically do not use percentages. You will usually, if they give you a percentage, as they have done in this problem, convert it to a decimal. Because we have said that all probabilities should be in a range from zero to what number? One. So all probabilities must fall within this range. Is 39.2 falling within there? No. But when you convert it to a decimal, it sure does, doesn't it? 0.392. So always be aware that when you're referring to probabilities, you don't talk in percentages. However, we as people use percentages a lot. So a lot of people will then take that 0.392 and actually convert it to a percentage because that's a lot easier to comprehend than 0.5. From zero to one hundred Exactly. Yes, it's just scaled differently. All right, next. Let the sample space be S equals that. Now, what, again, let's talk about this. What is sample space? It's all the possible ways that things can happen in this particular scenario. But whatever this is, I don't know what this is. Maybe this is a spinner with 10 unique spaces on it. Maybe it's a 10-sided die with 10 different um, numbers on it. Whatever it is, but this is it. This is it for this problem. Suppose the outcomes are equally likely. Compute the probability of the event 3, 7. What does that mean? They're asking you, what are the chances of rolling a 3, spinning a 3, getting a 3, combined with the chances of rolling a 7? In other words, tell me how many ways I can get a 3. One. One out of the 10. Everybody agree? Plus one ten. Exactly. Plus another one out of 10 because there's just one 7. I can get one out of 10. 1 out of 10, in other words, 2 out of 10. Can we put it in as a fraction, though? No. No, they want it as a decimal, which means we got to do that division, don't we? So 2 out of 10 is going to be 0.2. That's what you would submit. Alternatively, what you could have done is made this 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 plus 0.1 is 0.2. But whatever you want to do. You want to convert it early on or you want to convert it at the end. It doesn't really make a difference. 
Any questions about that? You guys okay? Yeah? Okay, next. All right, um, let the sample space be that. Okay, so something very similar, same sample space. Wait, but, question real quick. Okay, yes. one says an even number less than eight. That's not including eight, right? Correct, not including. If they wanted to include it, what would it have to say? They'd say including, or what would they say? Less than or equal, to. or equal to. So when they say less than nine, that means that you cannot have nine itself, right? It's got to be something less than nine. So even number less than nine, what is that? Two, four, six, and eight. Yours might be something completely different. Well, what is that? What are the chances of that? For me, that is four out of ten. So 0.4, exactly. Not as a fraction, as a decimal, because we understand that probabilities must be from zero to one. Got it? Okay, fantastic. Let's move on to the next one. All right, a survey of 100 randomly selected high school students determined that 90 play organized sports. What is the probability that a randomly selected high school student plays organized sports? What do we need to do? Simply do what? Divide. 90 divided by 100, which is just simply. Yours might be taken on force. 0.9, right? Good. Interpret this probability. Okay, this is where I really like this section, and it brings us back to language. Which option do I immediately eliminate? You got it. The exactly. This is not allowed when we're discussing probabilities because probabilities are never exact. They're approximate. So immediately you need to go with the option that uses the word about. Okay, it uses the word about. So that means that if we were to select a thousand high school students, what do you think? How many would be there? 900. 900 of them. 0. 0.9 times the thousand. So Yes, you can easily just add a zero to this, but if it wasn't perfect, you would simply take whatever number they gave you and multiply it by your probability. So what if this was 1,022? You do 1,022 times 0.9. Follow? Don't expect it always to be nice and clean like that. Uh, know how to deal with it in the event that it's not. Okay, next, number 16. It says... A bag of 100 tulip bulbs purchased from a nursery contains 35 red tulip bulbs, 40 yellow tulip bulbs, and 25 purple tulip bulbs. What is the probability that a randomly selected tulip bulb is red? Well, that would be 35 out of 100, but we don't write it as a fraction. Do the division, or you know that that's already set up nicely for you, so that would be for me 0.35. What's the probability that for a purple one? Okay, purple is going to be 25 over 100, but as we established, you don't write it as a fraction, you convert it to a decimal, so that's 0.25. And finally, select the correct choice. Which one do we eliminate immediately? Exactly. Exactly, very good. We do not use this one, so we're for sure going to select B uh, because it's approximate about. If 100 tulip bulbs were sampled with replacement, one would expect about how many of the bulbs to be red? Well, 35 to be red. How many bulbs to be purple? 25. This one was really easy because the bottom line is they gave you another 100 tulip bulbs, right? But in the event that they gave you not so clean number, 1,000, 5,022, you would just multiply the probability that you had earlier by that number to get the exact amount. All right, any questions about what we've done so far? You guys doing okay? All right, let's move on. So a gene is composed of two alleles. An allele can be either dominant or recessive. Suppose that a husband and wife who are both carriers of the sickle cell anemia allele but do not have the disease, decide to have a child. Because both parents are carriers of the disease, each has one dominant normal cell, labeled S, okay? And, so I'm gonna call this parent one, 
And this is parent two. Oh, let me change this. This is parent two. Everybody with me so far? Kind of like I made the dice, right? I made that six-sided, six-sided. Now we've got a parent, parent, parent. One recessive sickle cell, lowercase s. So parent one has a, a sickle cell recessive gene allele, and um, the other parent does as well. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Therefore, the genotype of each parent is SS. Each parent contributes one allele to his or her offspring with each allele being equally likely. All right, what are our options? Well, if you've done a little bit of science, you know that what they're referring to right now is known as a Punnett square. And so you're gonna match these up just like we would have done with the dice, right? So this and this would make an, a capital S, capital S as an option. This one and this one would make a capital S, lowercase s. This one and this one, lowercase capitalized. And this one and this one, double lowercase. Everybody with me so far? So that would go in as your um, options. Now, you read, gotta read this carefully. Uh, genes are always written with the dominant gene first. Therefore, there are two instances the offspring could have genotype capital S, lowercase s. Which one are the two? Right here, right? And like they said, they always write the dominant gene first. So I'm going to rewrite this this way. Everybody agree? Okay. So what are our other options? Well, double capital, double dominant, and double recessive. Follow? Any questions about that? Now, what is the probability that the offspring will have sickle cell anemia? In other words, what is the probability that the offspring will have genotype SS, lowercase s, lowercase s? Well, how many times does that happen in our four, in our four options? One time. So SS happens one out of the four. In other words, 0.25. Very good. So, I mean... This is just a more complicated way of, of doing all the stuff we've done before, and then they ask for a percentage, so you just convert it to a percent. Any questions about that at all? Makes sense? All right, great, let's move on. What is the probability that the offspring will not have sickle cell anemia, but will be a carrier, one normal and one uh, sickle cell? Which one is that one? It's these, right? One normal, the capital dominant, one recessive, the lowercase, right? So that means it's two out of four, and as stated, 0.5. Okay. So probability is 0.5. We always state probabilities as a decimal, and then they ask for a percentage so you can convert it. Okay. Done with that one. Okay. Let's go on to the next one, shall we? Okay. Um, a police officer randomly selected 632 police records of larceny thefts. The accompanying data represents the number of offenses for various types of larceny thefts. Construct a probability model for type of larceny theft. Let's take a look here. Okay, so... I think we're probably going to need to open this in Excel, shall we? And we were going to use it. I totally forgot about that. So we're going to do it in Excel. So the way you want to do this is first and foremost, you need to find out the total number here, which we already technically know. And sure enough, it matches 632, 632. Everybody with me so far? Now, the next thing you're going to do to figure out our probability model is 
remember that all probabilities must fall into a range of zero to one. So our probability of these things happen is what? Take the number two here and divide it by what? The total number of items types total number of offenses. Now, if I want to keep referring to this 632, I use the double dollar sign, right? And then I can just simply drag this all the way down and it, there it is. Now, how do we check that we did it correct? All those should equal one. one, and they do. See that? The sum of those equals one. So I know that we did a good job because the sum of these probabilities for our model equal one. In order to get these, first you have to know the total number of offenses or items in your sample space, 632 items in our sample space, and then you divide each one by the total number so that we get our probability. Of course, there's a check right back to it. So with that said, we need to round to three decimal places. Now let's go type these in. I'm gonna go type mine in. You guys can type yours. Pay close attention to your rounding. Very easy to make mistakes with rounding. Um, that's right, and it is, great. Any questions about that at all? So notice how I rounded to three decimal places accordingly. You guys know how to round, we've gotten this far, you guys are pretty solid in that area. Any questions about that? Now, let's go and answer some questions. Are we okay? You guys typing in? You okay? All right. Are coin-operated machine larcenies unusual? Okay, so if something is unusual, its probability would be less than 0.05. Okay, so I'm going to note this right here for you. An unusual is classified as a probability of being less than 0 0.05. So with that, now that you know that, let's go to coin-operated machines. Coin-operated -oper machines, the probability is 0 0.006. Is that less than 0 0.05? Absolutely it is. So yes, the probability is unusual because it's less than point, oh, sorry, 0.05, I didn't do that right. 0.5 is 50%, 0 0.5, sorry, not paying attention. Watch carefully, easy to make that mistake, 0 0.05, all right? Next one, are bicycle larcenies unusual? Well, if it's less than 0 0.05, yeah. Bicycles, 0 0.079. No, 0 0.079 is greater than 0 0.05. So no, it's not unusual because uh, bicycle larcenies are greater than 0 0.05. Everybody got that? Questions about that at all? Ready to move forward? Okay, good. All right, let's take a look at this one. Use the given table, which lists six, six possible assignments of probabilities for tossing a coin, twice to determine which of the assignments of probability should be used if the coin is known to always come up heads. So um, assignments sh blank should be used if the coin is known to always come up heads. So what is that? So always comes up heads is this one, right? Heads and heads. And so, I'm trying to think about what they're referring to. Let's see what, I wonder if it's D. Yes, they just want the one, I wasn't exactly sure what they were going for, but they just want the one that's gonna be a guarantee. Do you follow? So look at this, the heads, heads column is these right here. Which one would you prefer? Well, the one that has the highest likelihood of happening, which is the one with the number one, right? Because probabilities, one means that it's highly, highly likely almost guaranteed that it's going to happen. Make sense? All right. 
a baseball player hit 68 home runs in a season. Of the 68 home runs, 24 went to right field, 21 went to right center, 11 center, 11 left center, and one to left. What is the probability that a randomly selected home run was hit to right field? Well, that's a simple division problem, isn't it? So let's go take a look here. You might have to help me. I mean, I can put in Excel. Probability that it was hit to right field. Well, right field is what? For me, 24 went to right field. So that would be 24 out of 68 total home runs. So that's whatever that probability is should be your answer. So I guess I could do it right here and work it within Excel. So I do 24 divided by 68. And it says round to three decimal places. So pay close attention to that. So mine would be 0.353, okay? Probability that it went to left field. Well, left field is going to be, let's see here, left field is one. So it's one out of the 68. I can't submit that as an answer. I need to put that out as a decimal. And so that as a decimal, which I just worked off to the right, is 0 0.015, okay? All right. Now, was it unusual for this player to hit a home run to left field? Recall that unusual means that the probability is less than 0.05. Is 0.015, which is what they're referring to with respect to left field, is that less than 0.05? Yes, it is. Since 0.015 is less than 0.05, the probability of going to left field, yes, it is unusual. Make sense? Questions about that at all? All right, let's keep on rolling. Okay. You suspect a six-sided die to be loaded and meaning that it's not balanced, right? That it's not equally likely outcomes. You suspect this die to be loaded and conduct a probability experiment by rolling the die 400 times. The outcome of the experiment is listed in the following table. Do you think the die is loaded and why? Well, um, let's see here. We have rolling a one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, without even calculating probabilities like we did with the um, type of larceny theft over here on the right, does this look like it's probably loaded? Oh, yes. Yes, because the frequency of two and three is double all of the others, right? If this die was, was balanced, should all of these be about the same number? Yes, they should. So I would suspect, suspect that the die is loaded because two of the values have a higher probability of occurring than, ex than expected, okay? Good job. All right, in a recent survey, I should probably be erasing some of this. In a recent survey, it was found that the median income of families in country A was 57,000. What is the probability that a randomly selected family has an income greater than 57,000? Um, well, median means what, everybody? from what we learned before on the previous test. It is the exact middle. So if they say the median income is 57,000, that means half of the people are gonna have a salary above it, and half of the people are gonna have a salary below it. Okay, so it's kind of a trick question based on uh, previous knowledge. Okay. Explain the law of large numbers. This kind of brings us all the way back to what we talked about before with that problem where it said long term, long term. So large of lo law of large numbers, think the phrase long term. Okay, um, let's look at option A. As the number of repetitions of a probability experiment increases, the proportion with which a certain outcome is observed gets closer to one. 
This applies to casinos because they are able to make a profit in the long run because they have a small statistical advantage in each game. This sounds pretty darn good. Um, let's go on and read B. As the number of repetitions of the probability experiment increases, the proportion with which a certain outcome is observed gets closer to zero. Casinos use the law of large numbers to determine how many players gamble in certain games. That's not true. C, as the number of repetitions of the probability increase, the proportion with which a certain outcome gets closer to the probability of the outcome. This applies to casinos because they are able to make a profit in the long run because they have a small statistical advantage in each game. Um, this is probably a little bit better because I think that they're trying to drive at the probability of something happening, whatever it is. So I think this is slightly better than A, but I could be wrong. Let's see D. A and C look pretty good because it's talking about small statistical advantage. Let's look at D. As the number of repetitions of the probability experiment increases, the proportion with which casino uh, gets closer to the probability of the outcome, that's pretty good. Casinos use the law of large numbers to determine how many players. No. I think it's C. Let's see. And it is. Okay. The reason it's C is because not every probability is going to be 1. Okay, you're looking at the probability of a specific game. So there it is. All right, describe what an unusual event is. Um, should the same cutoff always be used to identify unusual events? Why, are we, why not? All right, well, we know that an unusual event is something with a low probability of occurring, right, everybody? Because if an unusual event, by definition, from what we learned earlier, is less than 0.05. That's small. What is a, a big probability? One. So the closer something gets to one, it's the higher likelihood. So for it to be less than 0.05 means it's unusual, means that it's less likely to happen. So A and B out completely. Let's look at C. The same cutoff should always be used to identify unusual events. And an event is unusual regardless of the context of the event. Uh, based on what we've learned so far, technically yes. Let's look at D. Uh, the same cutoff should not always be used to identify unusual events. Selecting a cutoff is subjective. Well, based on what we said, have we used the same cutoff every time? Yes, we have. That same cutoff was 0.05. So I thought that it would have been good. They don't like that. They want the other one. Okay, so just be aware. Unusual is going to vary. And I mean, based on what we said earlier, it should be the same. But for what they want, it may differ by the scenario. So just be aware down the line that that's going to be the case. Okay? Um, so the last thing is classical versus empirical. Um, so with classical, and here, here's one way that you can look at it. Empirical, find the one that is approximate experiment. So when you're doing empirical stuff, it should be approximation in an experiment, okay? So make sure that, that you see that. And I think you're looking at D right out of the gates. The empirical method obtains an approximate empirical probability of an event by conducting an experiment, a probability experiment. Now, I haven't defined classical. We haven't talked about it much, but here's the definition, I believe. The classical method of computing probabilities does not require that a probability experiment actually be performed. It relies on counting techniques and requires equally likely outcomes, and that's true. Okay, we've talked about it indirectly through the problems we've done, but there's the full definition. Got it? And that's it.